Good evening. Welcome uh, to this uh, special meeting uh, hosted by the Pelham Board of Selectmen. Uh, we do not have a quorum yet, but that's not going to prohibit us from proceeding because it's just an informational meeting. We are not going to make any decisions tonight, and so proceed. And first thing, I would like to invite you to stand up and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, just uh, some clarification. The intent, my intent is to open this up to questions as soon as we can. Uh, you'll be asked to come down in this manner and approach this mic, give your name, uh, street if you want, okay? And then ask your question, we'll get it answered. Uh, we have four representatives from Kinder Morgan. We have Matt Abdifar, who is the public affairs manager in the front row. Uh, Jim Hartman, my, my writing is terrible, who is the senior land manager. And Curtis Cole, who is the um, business developer, development manager, okay, did I get it right? And then Mark Hamish, who is the project manager. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matt is, I think, going to lead off with a presentation, so we'll give him, a, they've got about 15 minutes. And then, uh, Matt, are you going to be leaving sooner than the others? Or are you here for the full thing? Okay, so, and they've committed to about an hour and a half, so, and then once that's done, we will remain if there's anything further that you wish to discuss. All right, it's all yours. Can you turn it Yeah. Good evening, everybody. How you doing? Good. Um, so we're going to, like the segment said, we're just going to make sure we do this quickly so we can get to all your questions. So that's, what, that's really why we're here. We want to answer your questions. So I'm uh, just going to give you a brief overview of the project. Um, so Kinder Morgan is the largest midstream energy company in North America. Um, so basically, so we don't, uh, we don't drill for gas, we don't sell gas, we're the middleman. So we're the largest midstream company where we transport gas, so we build infrastructure. So this is, these are all of our assets throughout the North, North America. Uh, really what we're going to be talking about today is the pink line. So it's TGP, Tennessee Gas Pipeline. And there's already Tennessee Gas Pipeline here in town, so in Pelham. So there's six and a half miles of right away that already exists. There's two pipelines. One's a 20-inch pipeline, one's a 12-inch pipeline. Um, so it's a total of about 12, 12, uh, pipe, 12 foot of pipeline. Um, so basically, we've been here. It's, it's almost 10 years now. I think it's nine years, eight, eight and a half years, nine years. Um, so we've, we've already been in town for 10 years. There's also a compressor station right on the border in Wyndham. Um, so we already have a, a footprint here in town. You know, we, we've been here for a while, so you already know who we are. So it's a little different than some other towns um, that this project is going through. So you're already a little familiar with uh, Tennessee Gas. So this is a closer look at the TGP line. Um, it's 14,000 miles of pipeline total. Um, you see it stretches from the Canadian border all the way down to the Mexican border. Um, from northeast to southeast. Um, highlighted there is the Marcellus Shale, uh, which is the largest shale play in North America. It's the most prolific shale play. Um, so gas traditionally, historically, um, used to flow that way, so from the Gulf. Now it flows this way down. Um, that's because it's, it's closer, it's cheaper. Um, and again, we have the most prolific shale play in pretty much the world, but North America, um, right there. So these are existing shippers that we have in New England. So our, all of our pipelines, all of our projects are customer-based, um, just like Northeast Energy Direct. So we don't build projects. We don't, we don't speculate on customers. All of our projects have firm customers. They're done to meet a need. Um, and all of these are our existing customers. You'll notice and recognize a few of them, especially Liberty Utilities, which is the largest gas provider in the state. Um, they're also an anchor shipper on this new project called Northeast Energy Direct. These are municipalities with existing TGP lines. There's 10 different towns, including Pelham, right here in Hillsborough County. This is what right away looks like. And again, it's already exists in town, so you've seen it. 
Um, I have it in my town. It's, it's a white pole that kind of, it's a marker that marks where the right of way is. You've seen it in town. And you can see right there, that's what our compressor station looks like here in Pelham, right on the left. And these are examples of meter stations and valve stations. So Kinder Morgan in New Hampshire, uh, we operate approximately 50 miles of pipeline. Um, depends on where, like here, it's, it's been here for about 10 years. Other parts of New Hampshire, it's been here for 50, 60 years. So uh, long history here in the state. Um, we've, we pay approximately $1.7 million to state and local taxing bodies every year. Um, like I said, we have assets in those counties. Now I'm going to hand it over to Curtis Cole, who's our business development director. He's going to specifically talk about the commercial aspect of this project. Thank you, Matt. Good evening. My name is Curtis Cole. I uh, look forward to addressing any question that you have tonight, but my area, as uh, Matt was talking about, is talking to you about the uh, supply and demand side, the need for the project. First off, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, generation. Uh, basically, gas-fired power generation is becoming much more of a primary source of your electricity in the region. Gas-fired generation is already up above 50%. And the number continues to grow, so I'm going to talk about that and why that is. Where the gas comes from is what's called, in New England, largely Marcellus Shale gas. So in 2008, which is this number right here, this dark blue area was the amount of... Hello? 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 Yep. Amount of gas that you get from Mar Marcellus Shale. And as, as you can see, the number is just going to continue to increase. The reason that is, is because Marcellus Shale is the largest shale play in North America. It has the most abundant, prolific source of supply, and it happens to be the cheapest in all of North America. So as we move forward through time, they're estimating that 92% of the gas that you'll be burning in New England comes from the Marcellus Shale. Marcellus Shale is frack gas. A lot of folks talk about frack gas and say that's bad, but that is what natural gas is these days. Fracking is a technology that's been used for 60 years. So the gas that you see coming from Marcellus is a huge portion of that, and that's going to continue to increase. So in New England, the CEO of the ISO New England has identified a huge problem, and that is that the amount of generation capacity in the region is retiring. About 8,300 megawatts is expected to retire. It's largely coal and fuel oil uh, facilities, older inefficient units. That's 25% of the generation capacity in New England. And as those facilities come offline in the next five years, they're called at risk, by the way. They're not guaranteed to come off. They've been identified as coming off. And as they retire, you've got to replace those units. The way you're, the, what you're seeing right now to replace those units are wind farms and gas farms. There's a little bit of solar, but largely those, those two between wind and gas fire, those are the ones that are uh, proposed. So a recent study in just December of this year, Competitive Energy Services said the utilities, that's the gas utilities, such as Liberty Utilities, they use up what's called uh, 4.5 BCF a day in New, in New England. In the, and that's in the winter, by the way. But that doesn't cover gas for power generation. So they've estimated that the region, if you were to add 2.4 BCF a day to the region, you'd eliminate the, the pricing differential between New England and, say, Pennsylvania. That's huge. Gas right now in Pennsylvania is about 25% of the cost it is here in New England. And when you do that, they've estimated you'd save almost $3 billion per year if you were to do that. So this is just a, another example of some, some data, and this is all going to be available to you. Moving quickly, the amount of generation is increasing on gas-fired. It does not have access to firm transportation. That's what the Northeast Energy Direct Project is going to do. This is a quick illustration of homes, businesses, and industrial, the power lines serving it. And these are the different sources of generation. You've got coal, nuke, uh, fuel oil, wind, solar, hydro. These are the sources. But what happens is, when you have constraints on the pipeline system, you don't have access to gas, the price of gas goes up, 
price of electricity goes up right along with it. In Massachusetts, a couple of utilities, Columbia Gas in Massachusetts and Berkshire announced some moratoriums. They said basically we need NED to be built, otherwise we can't serve any more customers. This is a list of our customers that have signed up. We've been very fortunate to lock up 500,000 decatherms a day of anchor shippers on the project. <clears throat> Liberty Utilities is the second largest of the shippers. They are right now of the amount contracted. They're about 22% of the amount contracted. We're very proud to have them on board. Uh, this is a big deal to get this type of commitment to our project. That's going to anchor the project and allow us to move forward uh, as soon as we had a few more uh, key customers. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Matt. Thanks, Curtis. <clears throat> okay, so an introduction to the project. Obviously, we've kind of gone through a lot of it, but um, on the right is a timeline. It's our proposed schedule with FERC. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the overseeing body for all of these energy projects across the country. So um, it's made up of five commissioners appointed by the president um, that grant certificates for energy projects to either happen or not happen. So that's how that works. Um, so as you see, we're right here in the fi pre-filing process. So fourth quarter of 2015. Um, and we would be, sorry, we would be filing fourth quarter 2015. So um, we're up here so during the pre-filing part. So a lot of you attended our open houses. Open houses are part of our pre-filing process. Um, this is an informal meeting. FERC doesn't require that you have town hall presentations. We've done 60, 70 plus um, town hall presentations in this style, Board of Selectmen. Um, and we do that just to be a good company, just to get information to you. Um, the formal part of the process, which you saw with open houses, that's the formal part. The next formal part of the process is called scoping hearings. So FERC will schedule on their own a set of scoping hearings, which are kind of run like a public hearing. If anyone's ever testified before the state legislature or something like that, um, where you kind of go and give testimony, you're on a mic, you give your testimony, it's on the record. So it works the same way with FERC. So they'll have a scoping hearing somewhere in the, in the region, some in the area. There'll be multiple in New Hampshire. Um, where if you have any comments to make, just like some of you may have been doing on the FERC website, this is our FERC docket number. So I encourage all of you to sign up for that if you haven't already. Um, it enables you to receive, uh, if you don't want that many emails, you don't have to. You can just kind of log in. Um, you can get 15, 20, 30 emails a day. Anything that's filed on this project at all, you'll, you'll receive it. It's all free of charge. And it's all done electronically. So you can do that at FERC.gov. Um, so as we continue through this process, if you look at the timeline, we would be filing um, the fourth quarter 2015. Anticipated approval for this project that we were to go through uh, would be fourth quarter 2016. Proposed start of construction activity would be January 2017. And proposed in-service date would be November 2018. So it's a long process. We're right in the beginning, like I said, we're in the pre-filing part of that. Um, so this is kind of the outreach phase where we're communicating with landowners, communicating with the public, answering questions, that kind of stuff. So this whole project has a lot of oversight. The whole uh, interstate pipeline systems are all regulated, um, FERC being at the top of the list for that. Um, there's also the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, EPA, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Agriculture. Um, it also has a state component. So we have to, we have to get permits for all of this. So um, that process is, is meant to, the pre-filing process why it's so long, it's meant to do public outreach, but the filing process is also pretty long because there's a lot of permitting that goes into it, um, a lot of back and forth. So these are the agencies that oversee this project. I'm going to give it over to Mark, who's our project manager, just kind of give an overview of the project. Thank you, Matt. My name is Mark Hamrich. I'm project manager for uh, Kinder Morgan Tennessee Gas Pipeline. I'm going to go through um, some project description and then some construction information. What is the NED project? Um, these black lines are existing Tennessee gas pipelines. As Matt said, we've been in the Northeast, including New Hampshire, for over 60 years. This is the Concord Lateral that runs through Pelham at this point. What the NED project is, we, in Pennsylvania, as Curtis said, we're bringing gas from the Marcellus Shale to the market area in Massachusetts, including this circle here is where all our market is. We've got an existing system in Pennsylvania. We're putting additional lines next to another line, which is called the loop line. We're building this blue line, is what we call our supply side of the project, that connects the Mar the, our pipeline here with the shale gas, brings it to right New York. That's going to be co-located next to the Constitution Pipeline that's going to be built in the next year or two, and then we'll follow them and 
construct next to that line. The mark supply, the market side project is a 36 inch line starting in Wright, New York, comes into Massachusetts, enters New Hampshire, in the western part of the state near Winchester, comes across the state following the power line corridor down in the Pelham and then ending in Drake. And then we've got other connections where we connect our lateral lines, these orange lines where we bring gas to market to give us some supply security on how this whole market is being served. There's a FERC review process. I don't want to go in detail on this, but one of the t it's, it's on the FERC website. And basically, there's a lot of public input and a lot of public participation into this process. And so, as Matt said, he gave the docket number. And there's a lot of information on there, both about the project and if you need to make or want to make comments on the project, it's, it's also available. These are some of the towns that are impacted and uh, through the project, we cross through all of these, these towns, including Pelham in New Hampshire as part of the NED project. And there's just a map of the different 17 towns that we impact. As far as construction process, we do have two lines in Pelham. Um, in, 19, in, the, in the mid 80s, early 80s, we built, uh, replace, built the 12 inch line and in 2001, we replaced the 20-inch line, so some people here may be familiar with that project. But it's basically the way we build our projects. We divide our construction into spreads. We've got over 400 miles of pipeline, so we may have 10 pipeline spreads, 40 miles to a spread. Each spread's going to have crews. And basically, the crews come through, starting with your survey and staking, all the way through your um, putting your topsoil back and putting your restoration, and along the way, stringing the pipe, welding the pipe. Again, these. Well, we're going to have these slides available to the public to go through. And there's a lot of this information in our FERC filing. We just filed over 2,100 pages of documents and maps that's online that is very detailed information on the project. We've got a right-of-way team. We start out with our experienced right-of-way team. Um, Jim is our land manager. We've got three of our agents over here. Um, you may recognize some of them, and they'll be available um, throughout the process to share information with landowners. We're in the survey permission process now, so we're seeking survey permission so we can get on the properties and gather information and better be able to site this pipeline. These right-of-way team will carry on through easement negotiations, through construction, and through follow-up. So the right-of-way team's a key part of our process from start to finish on a project. We talk about co-location. Well, what is co-location? Co-location is either adjacent to or within, partially or all within an existing corridor. Right now, this is a layout, one of the layouts we're looking at where we can try to work with, the, we're working with the power companies and we're looking for areas where we can use the work side. All this would be inside the existing power easement. Now, this doesn't meet every case. I'm sure there's landowners here I know we've talked to some at the open houses. This is not every case, but this coming across the, all of New York, Massachusetts, and into New Hampshire, one of the premises we're using to try to reduce all the workspace outside the power line. So this basically shows if we need 100 feet for construction of this 36-inch line, 65 feet of this is shared on power line easement, and there's 35 feet outboard. And then the pipeline would actually be outside the easement and then we'd share because we need 50 feet. So the center of the pipeline, we need 50 feet for operations. There's a horizontal directional drilling method. It's a, it's a non-intrusive method to put pipe underneath resources. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We don't have any planned in Pelham, but we will be proposing to directional drill the Merrimack River twice, once from, once from Merrimack into Litchfield and one's from Drake it into Linfield on our Linfield lateral. Don't want to get into this compressor station, but we do have a small compressor station in Pelham we built, I think, about seven years ago. And um, don't operate it that much, but that was some compressor stations. There's only one planned in New Hampshire, and that's in the New Ipswich area. And that's just a rendering of that station. As far as environmental considerations, there's a lot of environmental consideration that goes into the project. First thing, we want to develop a route that minimizes impact using utility corridors where possible 
and we want to conduct field surveys to look at sensitive areas. So that's kind of the point we're at now where we're trying to do not only work with landowners to minimize impacts to landowners, but as far as part of the process, we have to gather all the environmental data. And then during construction, we work hard to train our contractors, oversight with our contractors, and make sure that we use all the best management practices to install the pipeline within all the environmental and safety compliances. And then restoration, we're here, we've been here 60 years, we plan to be here another 60 years or more. So when we build this pipeline, we're committed to make sure everything's put back and that we have satisfaction along the route with all the agencies and all the uh, landowners. We, I'm sh there's a safety commitment at Kinder Morgan, as I said earlier, safety and environmental are not compromised on the Kinder Morgan pipelines, both during construction and during the operation, and even in the planning stage of the project. So right now, you've got two pipelines going through Pelham. There's a 12-inch line, and there's a 20-inch line. And they, they, they're bringing gas to north and to market. I realize, um, so there's visual inspections we do. There's above-ground marker signs. Some of you may know the pipeline's there, some may not see it, because if you don't really know it's there, you could drive by and not know. We, we've developed plans to respond to un, unplanned events with the local response people. I'm gonna go quick through this. Here's the pipeline that enters along the power line in Pelham. This is, this is our existing pipelines that are already there next to it. And these alignment drawings, there's several of them. They're in the FERC filing. They're also available. They're available, very good. And so it's a little more detailed. So I'll end with these few slides. So uh, project benefits, uh, one of them being tax revenue, which, which was just referenced um, on that last slide, sorry, right here. Um, so if you see, look right there. So these are projected tax uh, revenue. That's, that's yearly, so that's the first year, 630,000. That would come about when the pipeline is in service. We already pay taxes in town. Um, on the pipe that we already have, as well as the compressor station. It works just like property tax, um, except it's a little different. Um, it's based on the valuation of the pipe, so that'll be the same exact thing. So projecting $630,000 um, for the first year when that's in service in 2018. Um, other project benefits, uh, we've signed uh, memorandum agreements with the laborers' union. Um, there's several ladies and gentlemen here wearing orange shirts um, who you've seen at our other events, um, right there in the back, the man raising his hand. Um, so we've signed agreements with them. This will be 3,000 uh, union jobs um, across the project, which is great. Um, the local business managers here that are in this area. Um, so this will be local jobs for our men and women here in New Hampshire. And then the last piece, uh, really for benefits, including the, the tax revenue and the, and the jobs, an additional 520 contractors outside of the union jobs that will come about, um, is gas supply. So I, I know that you don't have gas supply currently uh, through Liberty Utilities here, but this, this whole project is, is revolutionizing uh, Liberty Utilities' ab ability to service New Hampshire. So it's really going to expand their network of, of distribution lines and that you could have gas service here, especially because you already have pipe here already, and then they're going to be adding additional pipe. Um, so that's sort of the real benefit of this project, which Curtis is really talking about getting to the key of it, is energy supply. So lower electricity rates as well as gas supply. So I'll kind of end on that, and we'll just we'll go into questions. So I'll, I'll let the Board of Selectmen kind of run this part of it. Um, but as he said, um, come to the mic in the front. Thank you, Matt. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Kayla, you want to be first? Um, as you have said that Pelham has had two gas pipelines in town for over 15 years and we still haven't seen distribution lines come through town. So we're zoned for one acre lots. What is the likelihood of us getting distribution to our houses and residences if we haven't seen it in longer than 15 years because those pipelines have been there for that long? That's a very good, very appreciated question. So I, I believe it's 60 years in uh, this project is not needed to serve this, this area. What they, Liberty Utilities is doing, they're planning on serving this area anyway. They've told us very clearly, this is on their radar, they're, they're taking action to serve this area already. The benefit of this project is, can I use the clicker? Yep. This gas is Marcellus. 
literally trades at $1.67 today. The gas in this region can be $12, $20, $60. The difference is we are moving a large volume of gas to the region, and we're going to lower prices. And in fact, there's estimates that existing gas customers in, on the Liberty Utility System will save approximately 40 to 50 percent. If you're converting from propane, it's 60, 65 percent, maybe 70. Fuel oil, it's even higher. Those are estimates that are done by outside parties. Not has nothing to do with us. We don't do estimates. They're just simply taking the cost of gas, the cost of transportation, projecting it out versus what the options are already. Those are the same. Zero houses in Pelham have natural <laughs> gas hookups. That's correct. Okay. And I heard from the Constitution pipeline that that project is interdependent from your project. So that could happen, and then they could hook in to the existing TGP coming through and the existing Iroquois coming through. And that has nothing to do with bringing Marcellus shale gas to the region. So let, let me explain that. Constitution's coming up, and it's tying into our system and also ties into Iroquois. Iroquois comes down. They are proposing, they're proposing to expand their system. This system, like our system, is completely full. It doesn't matter if you put more gas into a full pipe. It's already full. I heard that the Iroquois wasn't already full, that they were not running at capacity right now. I'm talking about uh, Algonquin. So Algonquin, when you try to add more gas to the system, they have to expand their system just like we are. They're completely full. So they have, they're already doing one project. It's called Algonquin Incremental Market. It's AIM. They just announced another project, which is called Atlantic Bridge. It's 222000 They pre-filed it just about uh, three, four weeks ago. They have another one that's on the books that's proposed. It's called Access Northeast. It's designed to serve power plants. They don't have any customers yet. They went out with an open season trying to secure customers, but they don't have any yet. Do you have customers yet? Because I heard that you didn't have customers yet for the natural gas power plants that you were talking about in the presentation earlier. Yes, correct. Both companies do not have power generation contracts yet. And here's why. The ISO New England tariff does not allow power generators to recover the cost of firm transportation capacity on any pipe, our pipe, any other pipe. So what they're looking at doing is changing the mechanism, the tariff, to provide some incentive for power generators to hold firm transportation capacity on pipelines. Because in the winter, they don't have access to gas. That's why you see all these huge spikes. So the $3 billion that you're talking about is by adding capacity to the region, you add capacity to make it available for power generators, and you lower prices by $3 billion per year. So what we're look, working with are what they call the EDCs, the electric distribution companies. So is Spectra, or uh, Gonquin. They are working with the EDCs. Anything that happens on our pipe or their pipe is the same. So power generators are looking to, and the EDCs are looking to hold firm transportation capacity on the pipelines and then dole it out to the power generators. Another model that's out there, that, that would require regulatory approval, by the way. Another model that's out there is the NESCO model. That's the New England States Committee on Electricity. That was an initiative by the six governors. They asked NESCO to take a look at how do we fix this problem where power generators have access to gas even on the coldest days because it's killing us on price. Right now, New England has the highest energy prices in all in North America besides Hawaii. So they asked them to take a look at it. So the NESCO has their own initiative. And you may have heard it for a while there. They, part of their plan was to bring in Canadian hydroelectricity, imported from Canada. Stalled out with uh, Governor Patrick's initiative. They decided to stall that out before he walked and left the office. Now it's re-engaging. So there's different initiatives. But the design is, of the initiatives, the intent of the initiatives, is to allow power generators to have an incentive to secure firm transportation, which they do not now. So Algonquin's project, they can't move any more gas unless they expand their system just like we are. Same but, deal with but us. But the Algonquin uh, uh, line. Kayla, Kayla I, I, I think other people are waiting. Talk so let's get the answer and then let somebody else come up, OK? With the Algonquin. Sorry, all right, good, wait, all right, so With the Algonquin expansion line, they're, they are also trying to expand their system, but they're largely staying, I think, 70% within the existing footprint. So what is your project benefit to us, 
who we already have two natural gas pipelines in town. Why would we want a third one when there's another project that's working to bring natural gas to the region to lower electricity prices to do the same thing you're doing, but not going to take our homes from eminent domain or take our properties from eminent domain? What can you say to the crowd here to get us to want your project over the other projects coming to New the New England region? Okay. Their project doesn't have any customers. We don't, we're not allowed to put in a project without customers. We don't, that's not how FERC works. You have to have customers. You have to be able to demonstrate the market need. We have that. They don't have any customers. You so it's constant conception. You said you had 500,000 deck yes, mm -hmm. How much is your project capacity total so far as you are running it right now? Good it's question. Not, so that's if, like way less than half. That's okay. You can put it, uh, Algonquin's project that they just announced was 222,000. There's no rule of what size project you want to put in. I know, I'm explaining. You guys got to relax here. So 500,000 is what we have already. So that's 0.5 out of 1.2 BCF a day. A 30-inch pipeline at full compression is 1.2 BCF a day. If we were to have enough market, we would and put in a 36-inch at full compression, it would move 2.2 BCF a day. So what we're doing is if we put in a 30-inch, we can scale back the compression to match our customers. Same thing with uh, Algonquin. They're, they're putting in a 222000 a day expansion. They scaled it back to match their customer load. So this proposed project that they're looking at, they don't have any customers yet. It's a con concept. It's conceptual. Those expansions are required because they're completely full. So are ours. The reason we have signed up 500,000 decatherms of customers is because we're the lowest cost project on the books. Hasn't National Grid signed on with Spectra, that Spectra project? I believe I read that. The, what National Grid has done is they're an equity investor in the project. So they are an owner of the project. They're 20% owners in the project. And so what they're proposing to do, uh, Spectra is 40% owner, uh, Northeast Utilities is 40% owners. So they're like Kinder Morgan. They're owners. They're not customers. Sense. So they, they're, it's their project. So what they're saying is, we think this is a good part of the solution to the region. Let me also give you an idea. All of the facilities located along their system, we, we like for them to build. We want them to build. We largely serve different geographical areas. We serve Massachusetts, New Hampshire. They don't reach that. They can't provide the same level of service. There's a reason why Liberty Utilities went with us. They've analyzed these projects forever. But don't they both end in Drake it? No. No, they don't. We end in Drake it. They end in Beverly, over here. There's no line from Beverly up to Drake it. Yeah. In fact, when we turn on at Drake it, we're going to flow right back down into their system and feed their system. We actually, because we're higher pressure gas, they're a lower pressure system. We will be serving their system because you're losing the Canadian gas. So what they did is they filed to turn this line around and move it south to north, make it bi-directional. A lot of that reason is, or the reason behind it is you're losing all your Canadian production. It's declining because they can't compete with Marcellus. So by turning the valve on at Drake, we serve their system this way. So they don't have the same capabilities, and that's why Liberty Utilities didn't sign up with them. And oh, by the way, all of the agreements are subject to the PUC approval. If the, New, if the New Hampshire PUC says, that's not the best option, go pick option A or option B, and they decline to approve our contract, there's no contract. And the project wouldn't get built. They have to demonstrate to the regulators that this is the best choice. I'll let someone else speak. You, you can go back, but is this OK? Here. Paul Dadak, 17 Blackstone Circle. I'm not directly adjacent to the, I guess, the proposed right of way. Uh, but, and I was out, the acoustics aren't really good in here. Did you say the plan that's on the desk is not the most current plan? No, that's the most current. The map? Map? The one that you have behind, the large map. That's, yeah, this that's is the, the most current? The one that you provided? That's, that's the, um, survey corridor map, the town map. There are maps, the alignment drawings that are on the FERC website, more detailed drawings. 
So, so this is accurate, it isn't, it's of what you're proposing right now? Yes, it's accurate, and it shows the 400-foot corridor of where we're requesting survey permission. Because as I understand it, I've gotten a lot of emails, and actually, uh, directly say I'm on the Conservation Commission. Our chair is not here today, so I'm trying to ask some questions for him. And what he had tried to do is be proactive and looked at, a, a, not this plan, but the original, an earlier one, and tried to determine through our wetland scientists what wetlands might be impacted. What, and also, are we looking at what conservation land might be impacted? So, what we do you know what what is going to be impacted? What you want to do is go to the web page and get these maps, and you can see on these maps, you can is see. It, I didn't look at those. They highlighted. Yeah, okay. or you can or we can send them. But this is this is these maps have a lot more detail, and you can see they right. show they outline some. But of the so it is the current. Yes, this was, these were filed on March 13th. Okay, because we actually, if, if the, apparently there is a report from a wetland scientist, I don't have it in hand, but it was based on the original. Okay, and it's, so it's really close. This is just a little, has a little more so clarity had, for now, it. Because we're, a related sorry. question, there's a lot about permitting, and this is permitted federally. Federally, and state. state, and yes. If you're crossing wetlands, do you have to get a wetlands permit? And you have to go to the state of New Hampshire? Yes. So it would come to our conservation commission? Eventually, ultimately. yes. And we're talking, what, two months from now, three months proposed? Well, we're just in the, we're just in the start of the we're process. Right. So the FERC filing process, we're going to file in September. At the same time, we're going to put our right. application into the New Hampshire Siting Evaluation Council and start our permitting. There will be probably consultation sooner than that. All right. So we will see stuff related to this. Okay, now this, this is not as a member of the Conservation Commission. I'm on planning and conservation, so I have an interest in the well-being of the town. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the existing pipelines, correct? The ones we already have going through Yes. The, 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 but the new one is a high-pressure line, much larger. So it's, the existing lines are both, one's a 12-inch, one's a 20-inch. They operate at 750 pounds. So and what will the new line operate in? The new line is proposed at this time to be 36-inch and 1,460 pounds. So a kind of a different, it's still gas, but it's a higher pressure, so it's a different, more concern. Um, and you, you do, and, you, and your handouts sound very um, positive, but you, one of the things that I was looking at, it said estimated annual property tax payments to the town of 630,000. And from what I understand, and you all say approximately 75 landowners will be affected. The 75 landowners are who's been identified on the 400 foot survey corridor for us to go out and gather our data. We won't use the full, hundred, the full 400 foot. There may be some of those landowners that are not part as, of the project. And but so as I understand, there will be maybe encroachment on those landowners, potentially, some of them? Yes. And so, yeah, and again, a general question. You talk about payments coming into the town, but personally, if I was near the gas line, and I was really close to the gas line, I'd be going to the assessor and looking for an abatement and looking for my property value decrease. Right, that, that's something you would take to us. Okay, uh, well, we've got a couple other people. All right. Thank you. I, I just want to uh, let people realize we, and I think we're getting this full presentation delivered to us. It will be on the town website, so all of this stuff will be available on, on the town website, and at some point in time, Jim Green will show us what that looks like and how to get to it, the address. All right, uh, Bill. Uh, Dave Hennessy, uh, 71 Dutton Road. I'm also uh, Vice Chair of the Executive Committee of Natural Regional Planning. Um, I've seen uh, where I work, I'm a realtor who work in the Amherst area, and I've seen you guys do um, an outstanding job making adjustments for the Sahegan High School as well as in Merrimack going around conservation land. Um, as people, you know, looked at your route, they did negotiations with you, and, and you guys were very, very um, obliging on both of those, the Sahegan High School uh, moving the route around, and especially the Merrimack Conservation Land, which makes what you just said so disappointing to me. Um, you have put out a map that was dated back in November. Um, I went to talk to you back um, three weeks ago in Hudson in the presentation, we had a discussion about the fact that, in fact, this is incorrect. You could not co-locate your pipeline under the power lines because, as you put it, you were surprised 
by the announcement back in January before you guys that the, they were moving the center line of the power line over to the east of the, uh, I'm sorry, the west side of the existing right of way of the power lines. Do you recall that conversation? Yeah, but I don't recall saying I was surprised. We, it came up, and I didn't say we couldn't locate it. We have to get out and we have to survey and work with the power companies to see if we can get in there. Well, a couple of things are interesting about that comment. And, I, I, I spoke to the power line people, and they did a presentation here, I believe, last week, and they told me in talking to, to them that they've never talked to you about the location where precisely your, your pipeline is going to exist in the power line right away. Now, the, the problem I have, it, you know, this is, this is understandable. You know, they, they putting in a power line change that affected your co-location marks. But I'm extremely disappointed. I walk in here today and see a November map out here when you changed these maps last week. They didn't change. The, the maps are more. The maps detailed. you're showing wait, on, wait, your, wait, wait, on your on your on your on uh, your website is different than what is out here on the table. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, that's, so, when I- We just did this filing, we obviously didn't update the, the map. This, this is not updated, map. this is a November, this is your November map. You just said that you changed your map in March. Am no, I right? We made more detailed maps, I didn't say we changed it, it. No, it is more changed. Clarity. The route is changed on what you're showing on your website than what is out here on okay. the table. Now, with all due respect, I'm suggesting, I'm not suggesting it was devious or done on purpose or anything like that. But, but the fact is, in Merrimack and in Amherst, where you guys were so good in talking to a roused community and talking to people because they knew your route and could talk to you about where this pipeline was going and to make allowances. Now, one of the sensitive spots in this town is precisely where you're having to make these changes, which is through the Peabody Town Forest. And our Conservation Commission should have the same right that the town of Merrimack Conservation Commission had and in being able to identify exactly where this route goes and how it's going to affect our wetlands in town. I'm suggesting you delay this whole project until we can get accurate lines going through here and so the town committees can sit down and talk to you like they did in Amherst and Merrimack. We did not, let me, let me go back to Merrimack, to Amherst. We did not talk to Amherst about making that change around Sohegan High School. We made the decision, and it actually goes through conservation lands, but we're proposing a directional drill. We had no discussions with the school. We made that decision to do that. As far as you, it, I commend it, you for being so proactive. And, and in Merrimack, are you talking about near the river where yeah. we crossed? No, no, I'm talking about the, the, the your original lines that came in mm -hmm. on the map showed the pipelines being interrupted in the heart of the conservation land, and then you guys went around it which is great, I commend you for it. But I don't know where your pipeline is going in this town. And David, we'll, we'll make certain that you do know. That's, uh, that's we'll, our goal. We'll know. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that, that we've done, David, is to put these maps, current maps, that just got filed last Friday. So they're, they're current. Should we have had the same maps that mimic that? Yes, we should have. No question about it. So one of the deliverables that I can do for for you is to get you copies of those maps and if you'd like to meet after you look at the area of concern um, we'd be happy to do that with you well let me, Dave. Let, me, let me just finish this up okay I'm not trying to badge you guys but you're still talking in here about co-location okay right here in the in, in the first paragraph you're talking about co-location and yet we know that the original location of where your pipeline is going to co-locate with the power lines has changed because you, because the power company has moved their center line to the west side of their right of way. So we know your plan has changed. We know the, the people that you've already spoken to and begun surveys, some of them are no longer affected while other people in this town are unaware that they now may be affected because of the change of your location. And, and David, um, the plans that are represented here are the current plans that we have. 
Those are the same plans that we've sent to Eversource and National Grid. Now, and yeah. uh, we've been in discussions with them. Eversource. Hey, said wait, they hold, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think we should realize that in this process, there's going to be negotiations, the line's going to move. I think it's important that the latest updated information be available to us. But I think, you, and when you're talking, you, the negotiations, the line's going to move. So I think... You should be putting this up. What, 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 understand, they, we should have the latest information, and we need a way of having that so we can have access to it, so you can see it, and we want it to put it on our website. So you need to commit Absolutely to us that correct. we'll have Which, that. You will have it. There's okay. no question about it. Thank you. And David, we'll spend more time with you um, just to close it. Um, we'll get your information, make sure that we can get that, um, those plans to you. If you see Mike over in the second row there, we'll make sure that we forward that information to you. And we thank you for your comments. Thank you. All right, All right next. <laughs> Hi, Mal Peruccio, Talent Road. Curtis, you talked about market need. Um, how much gas does New Hampshire use a day? The whole state. How much is the flow for New Hampshire? Well, the, the answer to that is the exact number I don't know, but here's, here's the difference. Right now, New Hampshire has a very low percent concentration of using natural gas because there's limited resources. One of the main reasons that Liberty Utilities is securing 115000 a day is because they, they recognize the need to access low-cost natural gas. So yes, today you don't have a very high concentration of natural gas in New Hampshire. I think it's 20% of your... 14% of that 2.2 billion cubic feet. That would be on November's numbers, which were November 2014. 14% of a 36-inch diameter. Yes. Well, what are you putting in? Well, we won't put in a 36-inch unless we have market. I, I, I don't... Well, are you, you're applying uh, for a 36, though. So let me explain that. It's a very good question. People ask this all the time. We are filing the largest, with FERC, we are acknowledging the largest that we would be willing to put in if the market's there when we file. The market's not there, we're not putting in a 36-inch. We'll put in a 30-inch. The compression that you see on the diagram, it could be half that size. We don't want to be accused of misleading or misrepresenting anything. So when we go to FERC, we've already told them, we haven't decided. We might put in a 30, we might put in a 36. When we file in September, at the end of September, it will be very clear what we're filing. Right now in the pre-filing stage, because this is all preliminary, it's all in the pre-filing stage. We've identified both. And Liberty Utilities is your only customer in New Hampshire on that list, correct? So far. Unitil well, negotiated. Well, that's what you filed with is those are your LCDs. That's correct. That's correct. So Unitil negotiated. And how much of the gas pipe are they using? Unitil? No. How much is that 115 decatherms capacity of your 36-inch, 2.2 billion cubic foot? We're, sir, we're not putting in a 36-inch unless there's market. So if you divide it 115... Well, I'd feel much better if you put a 10-inch through my yard instead of a 36-inch. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. We will put in either 30 or 36, and that depends on the market. Uh, that, that is the case. So when we file in the fall, it may be a number of 750,000. So out of 115, you take 115 divided by 750. That's the percentage that's served in New Hampshire. Right. Liberty. And another and thing is, Unitil is still looking at contracting on that, but they're also looking very much so on Spectre's projects. They're mm -hmm. leaning towards their projects and identifying with their projects. But this, when you talked about um, the market need and when you, you talked about New England, everything you said was what about New England in the first few slides. It wasn't about New Hampshire. You were going to put this thing in Massachusetts, and they didn't like it, so now it's up here. I, I, I and most of this gas is going to Massachusetts, right? Most All of the, the way to most slide, slide number two. Yep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm not moving fast enough here. Okay. Yep, did it, did it wrong here. Which way did I go? I apologize. All right. You're right. From here, we were going straight across to Drake. That's, that's correct. A number of reasons why we moved up along the power line. Largely because we listen to regulators 
concerned citizens. It impacts New Hampshire now more, but it impacts far fewer landowners by co-locating the pipeline. Less trouble. Less impact. The regulators were pushing to get the utilities to cooperate. In fact, the more that we put on public service in New Hampshire's right-of-way, the less of an impact outside the right-of-way. We have identified as putting the pipeline five feet outside the right-of-way as just a stake in the ground. That discussion is ongoing and it's continue to happen over the course of the next several months. They have to look at our alignment sheets, we have to sit down and negotiate. There's going to be some areas that we cross over. There's going to be some areas that we're inside. There's going to be some areas that we're outside. Those discussions in negotiations as with anything. When you're starting a process, it's still early on in the process, you've got to sit down across the table and negotiate. They first have to review all of our data. So what Mark was talking about earlier is absolutely correct. We have a 400 foot wide corridor. We could move it. We have identified a preferred path with an alignment. That will be subject to negotiations. Working with public service in New Hampshire is no different than working with a landowner. We will negotiate. I'm, I'm talking about the fact hold, that. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I, I'm torn a little bit. I, you know, I, I want to hear everything you want to hear, but I've got other people waiting to ask questions, and I'd like to give them a chance too. It's just that this gas, a lot of it, 80% of what's going to go through that pipe is not going to be in New Hampshire. That's it's a fact. It's going to be in Massachusetts. That's a fact. That's a fact. And one real quick thing, and I, I'm going to let the next, uh, the Kayla. No, no, she already got up. Who's next? Next show. Wait, 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 stop. I, I, look, hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute. When I opened this thing, I said I would give everybody an opportunity to ask a question. If you wanted another one, you would be wait until everybody's had a chance. You're saying I shouldn't do that. She did wait. She got back in line. Uh, I don't, are there other people in line that haven't asked a question? I guess that's a question. You know, and I, I don't want to deny anybody, but you know, I, I'm trying to be fair. And one other while he's walking up, I'll, I'll try to talk very quickly. Liberty Utilities is looking to expand all the way along our, our system. The timing for that is up to them. They've, they purchased a gas propane facility over in the town of Keene. They plan to convert that to natural gas. Once you get an interstate pipeline in the area with low cost gas, then distribution companies come in. We don't know how long it'll take for that to happen. In addition, there's CNG portable pipelines that'll serve New Hampshire. There's, there's facilities that are already going in that basically put them on trailers. They truck them up to schools and hospitals. It is a growing part of the business as well as uh, transportation vehicles, CNG and LNG. The, the natural gas, whether we like it or not, happens to be abundant, low cost, half the emissions of other fossil fuels. It's not as clean as wind, not as good as solar, but it's very viable and reliable. Bob Rutledge, 96 Frontier Drive. My question is actually for Mark, the project manager. Uh, you state that you will be creating jobs, and I noticed today you have a workforce behind you, where yesterday at the State Senate meeting, you guys all left without any representation from your labors. Uh, I'd like to actually ask the labor union here where they're from, because none of these Faces look familiar to me, being a resident of this community. Wait. You're all New Hampshire residents? Could you? Okay. What? As, as far as... Uh, I, I, wait, wait, let's, uh, can, I, can I ask, we not do this? I, I understand the question. Basically, these are going to be temporary jobs, lasting for some portion of the project. But how many jobs are going to be for the Pelham residents? You know, so okay. We don't know. If you're not familiar with the way unions work, so it, it's all about membership. So there's a, a local labor. I am might, familiar with just, the. Hold on a second. Teamsters, hold on a second. Local unions. I right. was a member at one time. There you go. So my dad's and I'm a I'm looking so. forward to maybe, you know, doing work on the project. Not on the yeah. on your project. No, I don't okay. even want it in my backyard. <laughs> more concerned about my well, the conservation land that I'm surrounded by, and the town property. You're talking about putting uh, your passageway right along landowner's land, not on the easement for the power lines. You have to deal with property owners, not under the power lines. So how is this going to be uh, 
dealt with in our community. Sure. So Jim can address, I'll just start with the, so the laborers part first, just to address that part of it. So uh, the local laborers union, so these are New Hampshire members. So across the project, there's 3,000 jobs. Are they all it, from New Hampshire? So 3,000 jobs across the project, so across those five states. So the number of jobs will come from the local laborers union. So that laborers union, we already signed an agreement. It's up to them to allocate the work, if, if that makes sense. So when the work's being done in New Hampshire, like Mark reviewed the construction process, when that work's being done, those will be local crews. That's the whole point of doing it. That's why we signed the agreement. That's why it's such a great project for the laborers union. That's that piece. If it Jim wasn't for address. social media, you know, half of us wouldn't be here in this room this evening about protesting this. Okay. All right. You all set? Well, all right, thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, um, my name is Louise Delahanty. Um, my husband, Paul Delahanty, is here also. Uh, you mind, can you use the mic? Just got a little sure. Close. And um, after 72 years combined working, we retired to Boulder Hills, um, which is Winterbury Road, which um, comes right up to the easement. Um, I have um, papers from that, that um, the Richardson family. Uh, they allowed a 350-foot easement for the power for the power lines to come through, and I've heard these gentlemen say that they're maybe taking about 400 feet. The last condo, which is near where we are, is only 240 feet from the easement, taking another 50 feet in from the 350, making it 400 puts us a stone, stone's throw uh, away. A little bit nervous, but um, okay. our property has all of these no cut. Um, these are metal plates attached to the trees that say um, you can't disturb any of the trees, you can't cut. Uh, it's a wetland conservation district, um, the WCD signs. Um, and they are abutting all that property held in common. Um, Mr. George Hellesey will be speaking. He's the um, president of the board of directors. All of that, uh, the acres held in common, come right up to the easement, and 54, 50 more feet in, if you go to the 400 instead of the 350 that was granted, um, is going to take lots of those, the trees, the wetlands, um, rental pools, uh, walking trails, and I want to know how you're going to explain taking the whole 400, moving the 350 towards, um, towards actually, actually it's um, Boulder Hills, uh, comes under the, um, it's part of the Elderly Housing Act. That's another thing. So if you can deviate at all, I mean, I've been reading that um, you can have, you can, you've been doing some, uh, if homeowners have been asking for the, um, uh, the, they call it um, uh, a root alternative for the project, and some people have been granted um, land over, landowner requested minor root deviations, some of them for people so that their parcels can be subdivided to build another house, some people so that um, uh, minimize the bisecting run developed land. If you can do that for those people, for just the land, why can't you um, do something so that you don't encroach um, environmental land and also come, I mean, a stone's throw up to uh, buildings if you're going to do the 400 rather than the 350 feet. Louise, thank you very much. And, and don't go anywhere. We can chat um, because the 400 feet um, that we're surveying is not the construction impact. The 400 feet is doing exactly what you want us to do, and that's to learn about the property, to learn about the concerns that you have, to learn about the vernal pools, to learn about the trees, and then see what we can do to mitigate or avoid, if possible, with our proposed pipeline. So one of the questions that I have for you, do you know if, and I couldn't pick up if you actually, if you own the land or an, it's another It's held ant. in common. So we would ask, have you um, granted permission so that we can study those features on the property? No. Okay. No. So um, I, would, I would suggest, because you bring up some very valid points, and, and the way that we can investigate and determine if a, a route can be um, altered is through learning your concerns um, and identifying them and locating them. So 
that's one of the important parts of the survey process is letting you understand however you want to use that information whether it's in writing to FERC so that you can explain the impact but letting you understand the impact so so that's what we would suggest. Well, the gentleman who spoke just before me, he lives right across the power line easement mm -hmm. in a new development, you know, uh, Frontier Road. Um, and those are all new homes, young families. How are you going to explain to them? I mean, we're getting along in age, but how do you explain to them if, they're, if their uh, drinking water becomes polluted or becomes contaminated? How are you going to explain to them? If you have vapors in the air and you're polluting the air, how are you going to explain also to them if there's some major uh, incident where the pipeline, you have an explosion or something, and, you know. Louise, those are valid points, but n none of those should happen. And that would even be evidence. Shouldn't. No, they shouldn't. Because as you know, there's um, our pipelines that have been in the community for 60 years. Since 1951, our pipelines were constructed, and they're in the community. And I know there hasn't been uh, an issue, at least for 35 years, because that's as long as I've been here. So, um, Louise, um, those issues should not happen. The, the wells are not going to get contaminated. Um, they, they just not. Excuse me. Can, can, if you want to ask a question, make a comment, please come up. Thank you. Um, this is just... Um, the Alaska pipeline, it's, I mean, it's nothing, um, we're not talking, you know, but I'm just saying, would you want this within 200 feet of your home buried underground and then they're going to tell you that there will never be, uh, you know, everybody will dig safe, um, there'll never be any pollution from any of these pipelines, they're huge, you know, so. Uh, thank you. I don't think you're thinking of the. Uh, Jim, can I just add, pose a question to you? Um, we have maps which indicates where the wetlands are, where, where the WCD, and the question she's asked seems to indicate that your, your outline was going to encroach on that. Uh, isn't that something you should have, should have picked up or will pick up and take care of? And we are currently. Okay. We are currently. And what I explained to Louise was to be able to get onto the ground and do actual identification because right now, we're asking for survey permission. And survey permission across the properties is going to involve wetland identification, threatened and endangered species, cultural investigations, and civil um, alignment of the pipeline. So right now, we're in the process of identifying the physical, um, environmental characteristics on the property. All right. So it would be fair to state that you will certainly take into account any of the concerns the woman had about the WCD and encroachment, and that may end up with another adjustment to the pipeline route. And as well as we've, we're using all available public information, both from the town and through um, best available resources as yeah. well. But the, the survey permission gets us onto the property. Right, thank you. Next. Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> gentlemen, I won't need this microphone too much. I think I'm loud enough. Everybody hear me? Oh, yeah? Okay. My name is George Hallisey, and I am the president of the Boulder Hills Community uh, Condominium Association. 24 units, townhomes, taxpayers, everybody, are 55 and over. Some people in there might even be old enough to be your grandfather, grandmother, who knows? Easy right? now. Easy okay. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could call. I'm not going to get technical here, but I want to get to the heart what everybody here is talking about. What do you gain from putting this in? You told us, okay, that you really don't need us. I know what you gain, but I want you to tell the people here what you gain by putting this pipeline in. As a company, you are a, you are a profit company. You are a profit company, and you have stockholders you have to answer to. What do you gain? We are responding to our customers. But we're not your customers. Well, you, you, are yes. you, you, you will be indirectly, according to one of our customers, Liberty Utility. That's if you get in here. That's if, that's if you get in. We, we don't know yet if you're coming, all right? So go ahead. So a couple things. We won't file in the fall unless we've accomplished two things. One is we've got to have market. Our customers came to us and said, we want to get to the heart of Marcellus. It's the lowest cost gas. We're the only project that is providing direct incremental supply 
to Marcellus at this large volume. So our market spoke. 500,000 decatherms of customers at this stage of the game is huge. So we've responded to our market. So you need a market. The second thing you need is you've got to have it permittable. You don't answer my question. I'm sorry. I asked you what you gain as a company. We were responding to our customers. All right. I'm going to tell you what you're really going to gain. You're gaining that you want a pipeline to be able to transport this gas up to Nova Scotia to load onto terminal truck, uh, 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 to tankers and ship it overseas, bottom line profits. Is that not true? Very good question. LNG is a big deal. Everyone wants to know about LNG exports. So I'm going to take, take a few minutes and take time to answer any question you have about LNG. Let's, let's keep it not technical. Let's just keep we're, it we're down so we all can understand this. We're delivering gas to Drake. That's where we terminate. We terminate into Spectra's pipeline and Portland Natural Gas's pipeline. We only can deliver to Drake. If any customer, anyone, comes to us and says, we'll sign a 20-year binding agreement, we're obligated under FERC, we're an open access transporter, to sign them up. We don't buy gas, we don't sell gas, we don't drill for gas. We just move it. So if an LNG export customer walked in tomorrow and said, I want to sign up, 20 years binding agreement, we're obligated. We don't, we don't have anybody doing that. We just don't. So when you say, what do we gain? We gain a couple things. We're, it's an investment. We're putting pipe in the ground on our dollar, and our customers are basically entering a 20-year mortgage and paying us back. And we make money on our investment. So we're gaining on our investment. We, we don't care where the gas goes. If it goes to Massachusetts, New Hampshire, the state of Maine, that's up to our customers. Our customers dictate where the gas goes. We're going to be serving gas on Algonquin system. Our customers want the gas. Are you going to, are you going to stand there and tell me that if this pipeline goes through, that in the future you will not directly transport some of that gas directly up to Nova Scotia and sell it overseas? We're not transporting any gas to Nova Scotia. We transport to Drake and I've been other meetings, and I, I have to disagree with you. I've been mm -hmm. other meetings and other people who have been who looked into this clearly. Okay, and at the same time, why if you don't if you don't have a point here to make any money with us over here, why are you why are you doing this here? You have to have an ulterior motive. And I know as a, corp as a company, you're a, prof a, a, a for profit company with stockholders. You have to make a profit. Yes. And because Liberty Electric, okay, has said they're going to partner with you, we've all had Liberty Electric here. We all had our bills raised, haven't we, last, this last, huh? last time? And they said it's because, because they're afraid they're going to need to have more, pay more for the electricity. And then they notified us, and I talked to them, okay, and they said, well, we're going to lower that now down come May. What guarantee do we have that Liberty Electric, when if this goes through, that they're going to keep their rates low like they are. They have, a, they, have, they have control of us. Second of all, if it comes about, and you're saying that this gas is going to be now produced to the town of Pelham and all the people, who's going to pay to come in and put those gas lines in everybody's home? Is Liberty? Yes, that's how it works. And, and if Liberty does it, who's going to pay? Are we going to pay for it, or is, or is Liberty going to take that out of, the, out of the goodness of their heart and do it? I don't trust them to do it. Okay, so, so let now me, let me just stop a second. Show of hands. How many, just an idea, show of hands, how many people here are not for the pipeline right now? Show of hands. Whoa, okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to be able to get hundreds and hundreds more that show their hands up and stop this. Because when we stop it, mm -hmm. here's my last question. Here's my last question for you. What would be your alternate plan if you fail? You don't get it. What are you going to do then? All right, so let me know when you're done. because I No, I, I just want to answer the question. So what would you do? Let me answer that question first or the LNG question? No, the last question. What All would right. you do if you don't get it? We are filing with FERC our proposed route. In the FERC filing, there's a number of alternate routes. We constantly look at, and that's why Jim is saying, if we can get out and survey your property, we can, we've made several, like 100, over 100 modifications. We've identified this route. We have alternate routes. We're going to continue to look at them. <clears throat> we like to work through with landowners. We had, uh, was it uh, Hollis? Mm -hmm. Town of Hollis? 
that was a clear-cut example where they had some problems. They actually came to us and said, we have a problem with your pipeline route. We said, fine. Tell us a better one. They came back with three. We agreed to it. So that's how we like to work with people. We will do that again. Well, I just... In, ju in, judge, in, in, judge, in, clo in judge, closing, was your last question. Right? Well, in, in closing, had somebody walked, had walked the electric line behind our, our complex, I could have stood at the porch on the last townhouse we have here and thrown a rock and probably hit them. That's how close it's going to be to the 24 units we have. You talk about that thousand yard radius. All right, Judge, we got 20 minutes left okay. for other people. To, I'm just saying, you saw the hands there? Beware. Right. And while he's walking away, I, I do want to answer the question. I don't want you to feel like I'm not responding to a question. Right. Electric rates are determined by liberty. They, they're not allowed to guarantee anything because it depends on the cost of electricity. The studies have shown by moving this gas, you're going to significantly lower electricity rates. That's what's going on here. You're going to lower your energy costs. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Paul McLaughlin. I live at 22 Birch Lane. If you take a look at the second map, over on the right, where Birch Lane is, where the Birch is, that's my house. My wife and I moved in there in 1971. We were quite well aware at that time that there were transmission lines behind the property. What I'm here to speak about tonight is public safety, which I haven't heard mentioned in the presentation tonight. I have heard that the town stands to gain X dollars in tax revenue from this project. But I'd like to know what would be the impact on our police, fire, medical services in terms of equipment, manpower, training in the case of an accident. Now, I have heard that the pipeline industry has extremely high safety record. However, just the other day, we heard of an Airbus 320, of which there are some 6,000 flying around the world, where one of them, if we believe the news reports, one idiot decided he was crash that thing into the ground. Now, my question to you is, what is the impact of your project on public safety in this area, and what, if anything, do you plan to do about it? Thank you. Mr. What was your last? McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Yeah. MC, capital L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N, 22 Birch Lane. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so as far, as far as our safety record, I'll just start generally and then I'll, I'll break it down. Um, our safety record is, is published online on our website. Kinder Morgan is the only company. Hold on a second. Uh, Kinder Morgan is the only company to do that. Um, so we're, we're actually the leader in the industry in safety. Um, Mark's going to talk more about uh, like safety of the pipeline, more of that aspect of it. Um, but I'll just, from a personal experience, so, so I have two pipelines in my town. I have Algonquin and Tennessee Gas. So I'm serviced by Tennessee Gas through Yankee Gas in Connecticut. I'm a first responder in my town. I'm, a fire, I'm the fire department. Um, so Tennessee Gas and Algonquin both do trainings with our department. Um, so we have right in the station in the radio room, there's a contact list for people from Tennessee Gas. So someone like an operations or like a land person, whoever that might be, those contact numbers are there. We also do either annual, biannual trainings on if there were to be an incident with the pipeline. So that pipeline's been in my town well, well more than I've been alive. So, you know, 50 years, 50 two years, whatever it is, um, nothing's ever happened. So just from a personal aspect, there, and also there, there's no additional equipment that's needed for a pipeline incident. So it, it's not like it's, it's a different thing. It, it operates the same way it's operating now, and it, it's going to operate the same way. So it's, it doesn't change anything. So fire departments will still respond the way they normally would if there were to happen an incident. So I'm going to let Mark talk about just kind of pipeline safety and all the safety that's built into the actual construction of the pipe and as it lays in the ground. Well, one additional item. The history of earthquakes in New England is rather rare. We have not had, in recent history, major earthquakes in New England. However, if you go back to colonial days, there are records of uh, fairly important earthquakes. And uh, I suggest that the same uh, areas exist for potential earthquakes in this area. Well, you're exactly right about that. You cannot, I cannot stand here and guarantee there will never be an incident 
on this pipeline or any other pipeline. But what I can tell you is we've been operating our pipelines in New Hampshire for over 60 years, incident-free, with proper maintenance and proper uh, design. And this pipeline that we're looking at will be properly designed from the beginning, including the steel, the welds, how we coat it, how we put cathodic protection, how we put m mitigation controls in to control any kind of stray current from the power lines. The line is 100% x-rayed. It's filled with water and tested well above pressure when we put it in. And then during the operations, we'll have valves that should, in a rare event that there is an incident, those valves would shut off and shut off the gas supply. So it's a comprehensive safety program. And as I had on my slide, through the, um, through the uh, maintenance of the pro project, we have visual inspections. And we also have the cathodic protection that's on the pipeline, which is an induced current to prevent any kind of corrosion. So I'm hearing that, gentlemen, but I have to ask again the question. For how long is this pipeline being designed? How long is it going to be here for our great, 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 great grand grandchildren? The way we design the pipelines is indefinitely. The ones we have in there continue to operate over the years very well with the maintenance program, and we don't have a design factor. When we come in, we don't say, well, we're going to build this and buy steel that only lasts 10 years and put in a valve that only lasts 20 years. These are the highest standard quality of the material that we use and all inspected, quality assurance, quality control throughout. So we've got a pipeline through the process of building it, through inspection, through quality contractors when we install it, and then we maintain it and operate it so that it continues to be at a high standard throughout. We're held to high standards, as, you, as Matt said. The, you're right. The pipeline industry, if you look at it, the safety record is good. The airline industry has good records. But things, so we do have a good record, and we're going to continue on that program. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Lorraine? A quick question for you. Have there been any simulations to simulate wear and tear on these pipelines that you know of? Right. What do you mean simulations on well, wear and tear? Like well, you, normally, like airplanes, they run through, they run simulations, they got to look at stress and stuff like that. Yeah. Has anybody ever done any studies like that? As far as the studies, we do run intelligent tools through the line okay, to check but, for, but, it's on it's our integrity management program. But yes, the industry does studies, they do simulations, they, they do calculations, should there be failures, what's happening. So there is a lot of data out there through the FEMSA. So is there anything that indicates a expected lifetime of these things? No. Okay. All right, Lorraine, go ahead. Hi. Uh, Paul McLaughlin asked pretty much the questions I was thinking of earlier. Um, I'm greatly concerned about safety. I do believe that we're being used uh, by your companies, and I think we're being taken advantage of greatly. At one of the presentations you had, you noted that there were only 5% of the people in uh, of the users in New Hampshire and the rest of the people were in Massachusetts. Yet the pipeline's coming through our land because Massachusetts didn't want it. I'm very concerned about the <laughs> I'm very concerned about the safety factor. In our town, we bring water in trucks to put out fires. You pose a great safety to uh, problem to our town with this project with regard to safety and explosions. A number of us have shared through social media and our town websites that we are very concerned about the problems with safety and fires and explosions. You may state that you're the safest around, but we see otherwise online with regard to gas pipelines. Um, I don't know how often you check the pipelines. You, you said you have um, data, but data isn't good enough for me because I'm talking about my kids, my grandchildren, my parents, and my neighbors and friends. So that's not good enough for me. Um, I'm very concerned about um, that we don't have the infrastructure to put out a fire. If we had an explosion and the, there was the incineration with the crater that we've seen in the social media pictures, we're looking at devastation to this town and to surrounding neighboring towns. Any 
people who come from other towns with professional aid with regard to the firefighters and our towns, they're all going to be carrying water to put out our fires. Some of these locations where you have designed the pipelines to go through are very remote locations. And the other aspect is that you go through about 34, town, 34 roads in our town, so you're putting us all at risk. And the information that we have seen online is perhaps not even as accurate because I believe the devastation will be much greater. I'm very dissatisfied with the process that you're using. This even goes against our New Hampshire Constitution because any power that is not in the, um, the United States Constitution goes before the people and states' rights. We appreciate your comments. Okay, I just have a couple more technical kind of questions. Um, I was wondering if there have been any independent studies specific to the Northeast about power lines and pipelines being in such close proximity, because if there were any kind of explosion, which I know it is very rare, but it is possible, what would happen if the power lines that service the greater Boston area got taken out? I can't say if there's, there's studies, there's a lot of, and we can check on that, but there is a lot of co-location of power lines with pipelines. In the northeast? In the northeast, yes. We've got, in fact, we've got a line in Rhode Island that we've been operating since, I think, 1991, right next to power lines, similar to, <coughs> similar to what we're looking at through here. So just from Tennessee Gas Pipeline, we do that. So it's, it's a common thing. That's something, that's the reason why we have to work so closely with Eversource and National Grid as far as where we place the line, how we, how we construct. We have pipeline safety that we have to work with during construction. And then we have pipeline safety that we work with during the operations. And as far as, for example, there's valves. There's valve situation, valves which are, have blow-offs because sometimes you have to vent certain sections of pipe. Those valves have to be designed a certain distance from the power line. So there are offset distances. There are calculations that are done. These are the discussions we're having with the power companies to where we can do it, where their lines are, because until we know exactly where they're at, we plan for that. As I've far also, as, as far as, sorry. Well, we, I spoke with National Grid because they were here about a week or so ago telling us about the Merrimack Valley yes. Reliability Project. And they told me that you, your company, would be responsible for induction of current studies? Yes. In fact, in fact, we have to do the studies. What it is is there's, there's, straight, there's current that comes off the, pipe, off the power line. So the ground has natural resistivity and currents anyways, but then we're off the power line. We're, we're commissioning some, some companies. We're working with the power companies. We've got two contractors that are going to do resistivity calculations and straight current calculations all along the route. That's one of the surveys that we have to do through here. And then once we have that data, we can design a system that makes sure any of the current that stray from the power line is mitigated typically by using zinc ribbon alongside the existing pipeline as part of the system to make sure should there be any fault or anything from that power line, it doesn't impact the pipeline. Even if you go right underneath them? Even if you go right underneath them. It's a little, when you cross, when you actually cross, we're not going to be underneath the wires. We are going to be as close as we can, but except when we cross in some areas to get from one side of the power line to the other, we're, we're not planning to be directly underneath the wires. So I guess piggy, piggybacking off of what Mr. Hennessy was saying, would your timeline be pushed back, barring the end of the new power line that we're getting through town? Again, we're still in discussions. We're sharing our drawings. We wanted the power company's drawings. It's like, you give me yours first, okay? You're getting our drawings. We're getting their drawings. We're going to sit down and we're going to figure out where their proposed line is, where our pipeline is. There was even discussion, can we build it? in the same year, so there's less disturbance, so there's been some preliminary things, but nothing, nothing definitive. We're just starting that process of where it is, and as I told you, Jeff, if for some reason we can't come to agreement on something, we'll have to make some adjustments on that. I have two more questions, if that's okay. Uh, do, They're do, short do ones. Do quick, because I've got a couple more people, and we've got about five I minutes. Promised, I promised a neighbor in town, Mrs. <laughs> Currier, that I would ask a question on her behalf. So she has a pond on her property, and she was wondering the likelihood of mitigation for directional drilling or horizontal drilling or whatever it is under the pond to keep it further away from her house. And also, you mentioned that you weren't planning on doing horizontal drilling in Pelham at all, but we have Beaver Brook. Yeah, I don't think we crossed Beaver Brook, do we? Yes, according to the maps, anyway, you do. 
I think we crossed it on this project, but we we've, we've, we work with the environment. We don't have any plan now. As we go through the permitting, directional drilling is always a possibility. Moving the route to avoid those resources is a possibility. And we've gone through, I know people don't like to hear, but we've gone through ponds where you can, I, I don't know the exact, where you can cordon off half the pond, pump the water to the other half, go through a dry crossing okay. and go. So there's, there's many construction techniques we can go through, That's and we have to go great. through that as part of the permitting process to be able to mitigate these type of things, not to impact those resources negatively. I, have so I want to make sure that those one more we question. I have one more question. It's unfair Hydraulic hydrostatic testing, yes. is that something that happens just when during construction, right when it's done, or is that a routine maintenance? That, that's, that's just done during construction. You test it to over the pressure. So you never test it again from high We've had pipelines in the past. We won't on this line. We've had pipelines in the past. Part of the maintenance programs to come in and retest them. Why wouldn't you on this pipeline? There's really, at this point, there's because of the program of the tool that runs through it electronically that tests any kind of defect that's in the pipeline. All the, the test is a strength test. And then after you're going to, we go through and we do do um, the, in pigging where we get the electronic information of any wall loss. Now, there are, there are older pipelines and testing becomes part of the program of maintenance to re-ensure that those te pipelines are up to, you know, code and you might have to go in and test. Do you outsource uh, your uh, maintenance uh, to subcontractors? Kayla, can we do this? Because they're going to leave in about three minutes. Ask a question, ask your question, note it, get back to us. Is that fair enough? So we can get all the questions in? Is that fair enough? You have a question? All right. Please, next person. And I have one question, too, when you get that. Yeah. If I get time. Good evening. Jane Singleton on Hobbs Road, Pelham, New Hampshire. I got a couple questions for you guys here. Um, kind of an ethical question for all of you. I want questions from all of you. How many of you have your homes now on a pipeline? You do? Do you have family? you have children? I don't have any children. I'm, I'm only 27. How close to the pipeline are you? Very close. Is it going right through your property? It's in the, it's in the back of the Did the company <laughs> pay you for that pipeline? No. You got it for nothing? They took it from you for nothing. You didn't get any, any money for I'm it. I'm not going to get into specifics. Uh, you, you asked specifically I, 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 I have question. a pipeline in my, right. in my yard, and I do. Right. So is that your question? Okay. That's the question. How many other of you would be willing to buy a house that, that, sorry, that the pipeline is going through? It's a beautiful place if I was where moving you, here. Would you put your money, your, your mouth where your money is? Well. Yes. And, buy, and buy a house? I, I, I'm so, looking to buy a house. Right, okay. So is... Would you buy a house that, uh, that is in town with the pipeline going through it? Yes. Yes, personally, I would. Uh, we, we all live in different places. We're, we're not moving feel, here, unfortunately. How would you feel if you had property and people like you came in and said, hey, I'm taking your land for nothing. Too bad. We, you know, you pay the taxes on the land, you pay for this and you pay for that, but you get nothing for it. Jane, we're not going to take your land and we're going to pay you. Part of the process that we go through for easement acquisition is to meet with every single one of you, talk about the easement that's needed, determine the value with you, negotiate, and hopefully we can work out an agreement. So we're, not, we're going to pay you, okay. and we hope that we can work it out with you. I, I, hold, hold, hold on. Hold, hold, hold on. I understand your points, but they're going to leave... They're going to leave in about two minutes. I want to get the questions, and we're not going to get answers. I want to get the questions out there. I understand your point. Then the answers they're going to—if they had to buy it, they would buy it. And there's all kinds of things, all right? And stay around, and we can talk some more about this. But let's get those questions in so they can have them. Ch Chairman, and, uh, all right, we enough? apologize. This is not fair to you. We will answer your questions, but we have to go, and it's our fault. I, I Unfortunately, it's our fault. We screwed this up and scheduled another meeting. We will answer your questions. Please provide them the questions. Okay. We will answer your questions. We are not here to do short skirting. The bottom line is we have to leave and we apologize with our sincere apologies. We will answer your questions. Right. But unfortunately, we have to go. We have a lot of people waiting on us. We have apologize. Thank you. I, I, I think so, if you, when we started the meeting, I, I in, in, indicated that this would be an hour and a half. And we're at an hour and a half. 
because they have to leave. And But if you want the questions, we'll ask them. If they're gone, we'll still take the questions and we'll get them to them. All right? That's correct. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay here. All right. We'll stay here. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, all right. So, you, you want to ask a question? All right. Will you take the property through eminent domain if people refuse? All right. We, all right. All right. Advertised six to eight. What was that? Was this meeting advertised six to eight? Good. Yes. It was yes. Six to eight. But, we, but yeah, let's talk about that. They, they're not here six to eight. My question is your name. I think people. I think the meeting's over. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Come on, come on. All right. Over here. Let me write down your name. I just want to know. Is there any difference between All right. No, I understand. Okay. That's okay. I understand. I don't, they don't have any plans okay. to come back. No. All right. If you have a question, so I'll if take it. Does anybody have any I mean, questions that you want answered? Please come up and we'll, we'll they, record they them. We're supposed to be finished from 6 to 8, but they double, right. they double booked themselves. So, like, we can only get them for an hour and a half. But. Huh? I don't. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. All right. I don't disagree. And I'm. And I'm I'll do my best. I really will. I mean, it was hard for me to do what I did. I don't. As far as I know, there's never been a problem with, for anybody to get insurance on a property. We have two pipelines going through our town now. So I, I, there's no history of that being a problem. Okay. All right. Oh. oh. Well, no, no, if you want to, if he's here, he can answer questions. Let's ask him. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Well, I'm not sure that... Uh, here. I, I, there's no... There's no... Mr. No. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. No, 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 uh, let me, all right, all right, if, it, 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 if, if, if you have a question, please come up and let us hear it, all right? I have a question. I understand your questions, all right? So, I have a, I have, this is and, 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 question. I actually had a uh, mortgage company refuse me financing because of the power lines. They said that the power lines, were they didn't want to take the mortgage. I found somebody else that would. My question is... Is there a financing issue with either refinancing or if I try to sell the house, somebody trying to get a new mortgage, can finance people say that that power line, has I mean that pipeline has caused us, because you have hazardous material, we don't want to run the mortgage. Put that on the record. All right. Thank you. So any issues on insurance or finance? Should I'm making a motion you want. Mr. Chairman, Aye. I would like to make a motion that we continue rec continue with the meeting Aye. Aye. and that the residents and taxpayers can post. All right. We're, we're going to continue on. You got questions? Come on up. We'd love to hear them. Can we have your attention, please? All right. Hello. Can we have your attention, please? All right. All right. Mr. Those people that want to ask questions, we'd like to have you come up. Uh, if you want to have conversations, uh, just keep it down a little bit yeah. so we can hear the questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we continue to receive questions from the taxpayers, that they may be a, a record. We're, we're going to do that. That they we may be a motion. That, so that they are invited up to, to state their question openly on the microphone. It's recorded so that we can pass these questions on to Kinder Morgan. So just trying to get a little organization. I know a lot of people still have questions, so let's just take this opportunity now to get them on the record so that we can hand them on to Kinder Morgan. All right. Anybody want to come up and ask a question? What was that? I'd like to know what happens to my pro I'd like to know what happens to my property value after this project. We, we have uh, the question was asked of our assessor, 
is there any impact on property values based upon the pipe, existing pipelines? The answer is there were none. Okay. All right. Uh, we can get you that data, but if you want, but we've seen no impact on property values. Okay. Because I, I just had the assessors out to my house. I just recently moved to Pelham. Okay. Yeah. I oh. was running from this issue in Drake. It came to your beautiful town and community where it keeps me close to my jobs. Yeah. yeah. Bought a beautiful house, had it built, my dream home. Yeah. yeah. And the assessor came out, and a third of my property is the do not cut. Uh, do not disturb and now all the uh, runoff from this hill from the project travels right through my property yeah, okay, I yeah. don't want my well contaminated yeah, yeah. you know okay. all right. yeah we we have not had um, I, I asked the assessing office that question what is our experience with the existing pipeline and the answer is um, there has never been an abatement request that we know of and those homes have not been affected by the existing pipeline. I'm not suggesting that I can look into the future, but right now um, it's the market that decides the value of those homes, and the market is, has not been, at least, according to our records, any different from homes along the pipeline from homes that are not along the pipeline. Right. That's a fact. You can talk to the assessor yourself and get information if you like. Because my property receives all the runoff from Boulder Hill and well, all they that. will should have taken care of that in the assessing process, and I would talk to the assessor about that. Okay, I'll okay. come back and join you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also had two questions that I didn't get a chance to ask uh, yet. Was okay. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, just I'll be real quick. Uh, David Silva, Sherburn Road, and I don't know if they could answer my question, but I wanted to know. Um, for the last thirty some odd years, there's been about a twenty inch and a twelve inch pipe here, and nobody's tapped into it to be able to provide gas to Pelham or even other towns. I want to know what the cost is to tap into a 36-inch pipe, because they're saying they eventually somebody could come in and tap into this 36-inch pipe to distribute gas. So I want to know, they're saying that, then I'm saying, well, how much would it cost to do that? Is it feasible to say that somebody, Liberty Utilities, is going to come in and tap into their pipe when there's already one there that's 20-inch and another 12? So I just wanted them to find, I wanted to find out if they really believe that Liberty Utilities or somebody else is going to tap into their pipe to uh, provide gas. All right, the information, what you have to realize that uh, Kinder Morgan is a distribution company. They're building a huge pipeline to dis distribute to other utilities. They will not deliver gas to your home or anyone's home. I understand they, that, but they so, would so, know. So, they, so, they're so, they're so, in the business let me, of building. Let me, finish the, let me finish my answer, okay? Ch Mr. So, Chairman, so I understand. I, I sat here for an hour and a half. I understand exactly. They're not in the business of selling it. They're in the business of their middleman. They, they deliver it. I want to know from their professional ex opinion, I'm putting pipelines in, what the cost would be if they think that it would be feasible for somebody, Liberty Utilities or somebody else to come in and tap into their line, which they said tonight somebody could do. Because I'm saying if there's been a pipeline in here, a 20-inch and a 12-inch, which are not high pressure and nobody's done it, I can't see anybody tapping into their line. So the question is, they said that somebody could come in and tap into their line, so I wanted them to answer my question if they thought it was feasible, cost-wise, taking a high-pressure pipeline and trying to slow it down to a total pace for people in the neighborhood for gas. The answer to your question is, as I understand it, it would be up to Liberty Utilities. They would be the customer of this pipeline. Liberty Utilities would then have to construct the station that would convert the high-pressure gas coming into their facility into a usable pressure and volume, and then they would put the lines in. So we would be dealing with Liberty Utilities okay. as a Mr. local... Mr. Chairman, utility. again, I understand what you're saying, but I'm asking, I wanted to ask the professionals their opinion of the cost. Yeah, we'll get you an answer. Okay. Yeah, thank so you. I, yeah, so we'll get an answer. Well, it'll be on the record. Okay, yeah. okay. Diane Brunel, uh, 39 Briarwood Road. Uh, I'd like to know is, uh, I'm, I have ledge everywhere on my land. Are they going to dynamite? They're going to have to dynamite. What happens to our houses when they start cracking and everything else? They have never covered that over here tonight. Okay. So, so, so the, so they the, are going to dynamite, correct? No, I don't know that. I don't know. So the basic question is, that I understand it, 
is if they hit ledge, will they have to remove it through uh, dynamite, other things, or will they drill, or will they bypass it? So that would be the question. Is that fair enough? They bypass, and that means it's coming closer to my home. Well, I understand. And that was my so, uh, other question. If we all refuse, they're going to take it through eminent domain anyway. So, you know, that's a problem. And then if I want to put in a pool, what happens then if you're 350 feet in? What happens if I want to put a pool in the following year that they put the pipeline through? What happens then? Well, we well, can get an answer to that question, okay. too. Yeah. And the other thing is... Uh, Nobody's going to buy, want to buy our home, so how much in taxes are we going to get reduced because of that? Yeah, I, I don't, I, 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 you may not have heard me, but I told the gentleman before, I can't look into the future, I have no idea. But right now, there is no difference in taxation between homes on the pipeline in Pelham and homes not on the pipeline in Pelham. And the reason for that is because the market value is not different. It could be for this, I don't know, <clears throat> but it is not today. Yeah. Okay. okay, and, uh, geez, I forgot, where's my note here? Oh, uh, they should update those sheets because at first they said they did them on March 25th, it was yes. really November, yeah. but the street here, like my street, is a different street and it's not updated. Okay. So I would hope that you would tell them the correct name of our street. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. James Singleton, Hobbs Road again. Another strange question, you might say. Um, a couple years ago, I um, approached the town on a personal note to raise the roof of my house. They said no, because it was too close to the property line to the next house. But yet, now you're considering to let a pipeline come in, which is going to danger the town, possibly not get any taxes from it, is no revenue from it, and we're not going to benefit from it. And you people are saying, oh, maybe we'll let you do it. Where is the um, balance on this? The, the roof on my, the, raising the roof on my garage would have brought in revenue to the town because it would have raised my taxes. It also would have added value to my home. Where's, again, where is the balance on this? What, what was right and what is wrong? Right. Well, I think there's a couple of question, questions you got there. Let me try to answer them. One is we have, we do not get a vote. Just, we as selectmen don't get a vote don't on whether vote. they put the pipeline in pipeline's or not. The not going to benefit anybody. I, I, I'll accept that, that statement. Except the company. I, 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 but they will be assessed. They will pay taxes if they put the pipeline in. That's, that's a big if, all right? But they already pay taxes on the existing pipelines. So all right, what about the people that the, 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 um, the pipeline is going through their property? Are you going to charge them taxes on the, still on their property, or are you going to okay. give them a reduced it, it, rate it, it, it so is, that it, they it, don't pay taxes on that land that it's going through? The I pipeline can, can, is not going to be a tax as a, in a, as a taxable item to the property owner. It is just the pipeline company. And we have the existing data that we have on the impact of pipelines on existing property in town is that there is none on the value of the property. There is no difference in the valuation of the property whether or not they have a pipeline running through it right now in Pelham. The 12-inch line, the 20-inch line. That's based on the assessor looking at the records. All right. All right. So who's next? Um, yeah, that was all. Okay, thank you. thank you. Paul, you had questions? Uh, the two questions that I wanted to ask Kinder Morgan was, um, a, a current state was, if it's determined that they're going to take up to 400 feet to put in the, an easement, to put in the pipeline, but in, within that 400 feet, if some of that land is not deemed suitable, in other words, wetlands, or they have to try to avoid it, at what point can they continue to take up? So if they come across a taxpayer's property that that 400 feet involves wetland, can they say, all right, this is the situation where we're going to take 500 feet, like an answer to that question, to say how far can they go? And let me, uh, I think the basic question is, will they be allowed to encroach on wetlands? Because I think that's one of the things is, uh, my understanding is that they have to avoid that or they're going to tunnel under it. <laughs> and, and, but I don't know that. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so 
that's that's the thing is are they going to avoid the wetlands and in, in, in doing so, and if so do will they take problem? more land right I understand. Yeah. and this and the second question is that um, one gentleman said that the size of the pipeline that they're going to put in is going to be based on demand so that if in the fall, they say our customers only deem a 10 inch pipeline and they put in a 10 inch pipeline. Oh. But five years from now, they say, hey, our demand is way up. We're coming through again. We're going to rip out the 10 inch pipeline and put in the 36. Are we going to be faced with this project all over again because they had an increase in demand? The, the answer to that, by the way, is no. And the reason is they're not going to put a 10 inch line. They're either going to put 30 inch or 36. That's their filing with, the, with FERC. They're either going to put 30 inch. The 36 will, if there's sufficient demand, that will justify the additional size of pipe and they would, can find customers for the addition volume, they'll put a 36. Otherwise, it'll be 30. That's, so, that's it. So it's an all or nothing. They're it's not going to put exactly. in a smaller. Right. Right. Okay. So we won't be faced with them coming through again, ripping up the right of way. No, I, I, I th think if they were going to do that, what you got an existing right of way. Take, put it in there. I, no, I don't think so. I, I have a question. I want to get my question out, too. And the thing is, or the question I was going to ask is the, they're talking about up to 2.2 billion cubic feet of volume per day. If you do the math, all right, that you've got a, if I assume it's, the inside diameter is 36 inches, which I doubt it will be. But just doing that, do the, you get the area, you got the flow rate. That gas is going to be flowing at a rate of, um, what did I come up with? Twenty-four hundred miles an hour, or about 3,600 feet per second. And the question would be, with something flowing that fast, what are the impacts on it? Does it build up static electricity on the walls? Is there corrosion based upon that? Because you've got this turbulence going on in there. So there's a, a questions about, I, I, it was astounding when I looked at the numbers. And but almost four times the speed of sound. And uh, what's the impact of that? So that's my question. Paul? Good evening again. Still Paul McLaughlin, still 22 Birch Lane. All right, glad to hear that. A few questions. Uh, first one is, they're talking a tax payment, they're projecting at $600,000 per year approximately, I believe. Well, <clears throat> well, when we see our town warrant, we are told what the impact on each uh, typical home would be financially. I'd like to see that information. You, if they contribute $600,000 in tax revenue? Yeah. How much would it, would it, it save me? It's on 50 on cents on the tax rate. Okay. Now, uh, beyond that, I have to make a Maybe 45 cents. The observation is this. It is true that this meeting was called for one and a half hours of their presence. However, they knew darn well that this is a highly emotional uh, subject in this town, that people would have a lot of questions, and frankly, even though they were only asked to be here for an hour and a half, they really should have been with us until the questions were in fact posed yeah, to agree. them. Okay. I agree. Paul, Paul, Paul first of all, you, we all agree with that, uh, but we had to do some arm twisting. Uh, Brian McCarthy had to do some arm twisting to get him here in the first place, and unfortunately, or either by design or just by happenstance, they had another meeting set up in London at 8 o'clock. So that's why we're compressed. I tried to make the most of the time. We limited them to 15. They took 20 minutes on, on the presentation so we could have the questions, and that's why I was... Get, I, I wanted to get more flow in here so we get the questions out in some, you know, but we did the best we could. I mean, a lot of issues are raised, which is important. I just wanted to keep it going. And, and that's why we're staying here, so we get the questions on records and we get answers. And my final observation is that another citizen tonight mentioned Article 10 of the amendments to the Constitution, states' rights. And knowing that the real power on this project is not at the town level, not at the state level, but at the federal level. Mm -hmm. This is the sort of thing which says to people, dang it, where the heck is the power in this country? Is it in the people or is it in the corporations? Ask Senator Warren. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Uh, thank you, Paul. I, I, first of all, Paul, I, I, I have to agree with you 
on this it is a but there are several approvals needed it's not just FERC or the Federal Energy Regul Regulatory Committee but it's also the site of I, I don't know if site evaluation committee gets involved in this in New Hampshire but the PUC gets involved uh, so there is some process within the state that has to be uh, also taken care of and approved I'm not sure exactly how much and actually we have a question out Brian did we have didn't, did the consortium of towns did they have a question as to the limit of the state's ability to what voice they have on the approval of this product do we have an answer to that the no we don't I mean the, the general answer is this that uh, we can voice our opinion through the avenues of the SEC and through FERC mm -hmm. if FERC approves this project and it gets approved there's there's not a lot that we can do even at the state level I mean if the state if the governor gets involved and our state senators get involved and our legislators and our representatives get involved then yeah they could they could have an impact on this I believe uh, for New Hampshire right but as it is right now there's just not nobody's talking on the, on that end of the spectrum All right just to add to that uh, one of my arguments has been to um, a group uh, formed under NRPC National Regional Planning Commission uh, is that we and actually I think to other people we need to have a database that's credible to justify any position we want to take because eventually if we're going to want to do something to halt this line we're going to have to appeal to the governor's office to this to our uh, congressmen and senators uh, and we can only do that we can't do it with emotions we got to do it with factual information that demonstrates to them that this is not a good project for the, the state of New Hampshire and so that if you really want to have an impact and you want to stop this project you, that's where you're gonna to have to do it I think uh, unless anybody can uh, has any uh, different idea than that we got more questions so McCold and seven Shelley Drive uh, I have two questions one for Kinder Morgan. How are we going to get these answered? These questions answered. Are they going to come back here? Is it on? I'm going to take the questions and get with Matt. I am going to try and get them to come back for a more question and answer. So I told Matt that tonight before he left, and we're going to try and work out uh, some type of schedule to get him back. So I will try to get him and Kinder Morgan to come back so uh, we can have another Q and A. Okay. Uh, also. Okay. Okay, also, just uh, we intend to make all this information available on the town website. Okay. All right. If we have questions, we get an answer. It'll be posted. Right. All right. Okay. My uh, my other question is that would be for the company is uh, taxes aside, where is the benefit of a transportation line, especially a large one like this, going through Pelham? Where is the benefit for the for the taxpayers of Pelham, especially the landowners are going to be impacted by this I don't see it myself but I'd like to have them answer that question the other side besides uh, their profit well I, that's my question to them if you want to okay. record that. I understand all right we'll put it to I, I I know my answer is I don't see much benefit to the town no and no. the other question I've had is for the the, the elected board of uh, the selectmen in our town have you taken a public stance on your position in this on this pipeline yeah. and if you have what is it and if you haven't are you going to take a stance because I don't think I mean, we, we can we speak did, all day Paul, long Paul, we did you did and we what did was we took a vote about a month ago maybe a little long, longer than that and the position we took is uh, based upon the current information we could not support the pipeline coming through Pelham well I applaud you for that I think that's very important because you are elected officials we elected you to represent us we can speak all day long to these people in the big companies yeah. and unless we have backing from the Board of Selectmen and then up we not we will never be able to defeat this or at least change it to a to better to a better situation so we can't do it on our own we need your support and I appreciate right now that we have your support and I hope we can continue having your support on this yeah, obviously you will yeah we're not I, I, I'm not going there I don't say what pocket line everybody's pocket but the point is we need we need to come together as a group not just oh, individuals in order for this to be uh, to be changed or put in a better situation for the for the property owners of this town yeah. okay thank, thank you, you. Um, mr. chairman yep. um, I'm not pulling a kinder Morgan I have to leave for 10 minutes to pick up my wife 
and I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, anybody else? Go ahead. All right, hi. Hi, I'm Sheila Marku. I live on Brandy Lane. Um, I'd like to know what um, everybody's asking, what are the benefits that Pelham will receive? Now, we've heard some tax benefits, um, but I see more detriments. The fire and the safety, the training, the infrastructure of the roads with all this construction coming through. Um, I also see, um, what are my rights as a homeowner near this? Now, I may, not, uh, I may not be a direct abutter, but I'm within 600 feet of this. So do I, have no, do I have no say? Do they not have to negotiate with me? So, you know, 600 feet, 1,000 feet, it doesn't matter when it blows up. And it's unlikely that it's going to blow up, but there's still that danger, and you still have to prepare for it. So the town has to put out a whole lot of money and a whole lot of training and a whole lot of upkeep. And we as taxpayers have to pay it in more ways than one. So let's stay on top of this and make sure that it doesn't go through. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, two quick questions. Does Kendall Morgan so, 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 I, so I gotta get this thing. You come up, I'm only kidding, but you, you come up two questions, back two questions, I like I it. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I go, keep going. <laughs> Trying to break them up. Um, does Kinder Morgan as a company believe that if an alternate solution came up to get more gas into the area that required little or no eminent domain, it would be a better solution even if it was with a different company that they would support? That's one. Two, has Kinder Morgan in the last 10 years ever put an application in front of FERC that didn't get approved? Wow. Good question. Kelly, are you got more questions? No, I don't have questions. I just wanted to announce the meeting on Monday. Oh, okay. Actually, All so right. we're having a meeting on Monday night. It's at six o'clock. Um, we'll start. The doors are going to open at like six thirty. The presentation is going to start at seven, and we'll be around to answer questions. Until Where are you meeting? Here at the Sherburn Hall. Mr. Meyer, you're welcome to come back if you would like to. Um, Kinder Morgan's also going to be at Wyndham, I think, on uh, the same night. So if you wanted to try and get your question at 7 o'clock, if you wanted to try and get your questions answered after all the Wyndham residents spoke, but I don't think that Kinder Morgan's going to stick around to hear from Pelham again if they're not even sticking around to hear from Pelham now. So I recommend you come to our meeting. Where's the meeting Monday night? S Sherman Wyndham Hall. High School. Yep. This room? This room. What time? 7. Put it on Facebook. <laughs> it is. It is. It's there. It's on Facebook. Oh we'll put God. it again. That, that, that side has been a godsend. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. uh, anybody else? Paul? I see him making his way to the mic. Third time, so far, McLaughlin's still 22 Birch Lane. We've heard it tonight, and we've heard it before, that the electric people and the gas people never talked about this until recently together. Now, either somebody is throwing a load of bull, or both of those companies are negligent in their attitude toward the state of New Hampshire and the town of Pelham. Thank you. All right. It's not a question, it's a, comment, a statement. I understand. Good yeah. thing. Yeah. All right. Hey. Their company has nothing to lose. Hello. Um, Everything to gain. Paul Staniak uh, for National Road. Um, I just have to follow up on Phil's uh, McCulligan's thought. Um, has the selectman or anybody from the town tapped into uh, other towns because they're doing the same thing right now uh, to get more information and uh, lessons learned? And I think this is a grassroots type of thing to, to, to fight this. And, and I would uh, suggest maybe someone in the town to get more information from other towns to see what's been going on. The answer to your question is yes. Uh, and there's two things. Uh, Brian McCarthy is our town administrator. He's our representative, and he is a member of the all the towns affected. Their administrators have all got together, and they meet regularly uh, to discuss this thing and hopefully come out uh, with a common uh, statement or a strategy. Uh, different towns have done different things. Um, some towns, uh, Kayla provided me with a great listing of all the warrants that were approved. And one of the towns, a small town, uh, appropriated $80,000 in legal fees. It was Brookline? Yeah, $80,000 to, to, to 
for that purpose. Uh, we have not gone that route yet, uh, and we do not know if there will be a great cost and how we would pay for it if we got into it. Uh, secondly, um, there is the National Regional Planning Commission has uh, created a subcommittee called in, um, Energy Facilities Advisory Committee, which is looking at the pipe pipeline and each town is appointed a representative. I am a representative to that committee. We're meeting tomorrow. We've had some other meetings. And that one there is the way we're approaching it is we're trying to rate what are the questions we want answered. Because if you approach this thing and you worry about incineration and all this, thing, if you don't have a specific item to research and get data on, you're just floundering. So we're trying to create a list of questions more on the technical or the economic side, so we can then research and say, here's the impact. And that, I, we would feel that that would be a val very valuable tool to go again to the governor or the thing. So we, we're trying to put together a fact sheet, if you will, answering these questions. Uh, one area is, you know, what's the impact on historical research, on economics, on environment? Uh, so, so yes. Okay, sounds good. I just think you know, the, the, there's other towns that are going through the same thing where absolutely, having, and everyone has different ideas, and some are better than others. And yeah, yeah. I think we should tap into that. Yeah, it, it actually, and it's kind of overwhelming because you there's a lot of data out there, and I know I was at a uh, presentation uh, along with some members of this audience up in Wyndham, and the gentleman from Drake it, man. He had a wealth of data and a lot of information. Um, and he knew all the pipelines, where they were going, and so uh, it was good. And so it's, again, like I say, I think we're trying to accumulate so we have a credible, whatever position we take, we have a credible basis for it. Mr. Chairman, I think another reasonable request of Kinder Morgan is, um, and I think Mr. McCarthy might already have been trying that, is to get timely updated information and I think a case in point tonight was the map issue um, where where if they're coming to meetings that um, information is, is being handed out that is dated we're not getting the most up-to-date and reasonable facts to make a decision and to base conversations on so I think that's a reasonable request that we can make of Kinder Morgan it is a reasonable request but I would argue it's a pipeline it's a pipeline it's a pipeline it's going to move a little bit here going to move a little bit here the issue is not going to be decided by that line, taking a little jog here, a little jog here. Is the question is, is the pipeline, do you want it or not? And it's, obviously it's going to have impact on individuals, but from a statewide impact, where that jog is, not going to be significant. And that was, it's personally, it's significant to the people affected, but from if you, we focus on that, we're not focusing on the bigger picture that we have to deal with and get our facts together. I think it does go back to a little bit of credibility, though, if, if, if they're handing out information that's... Well, yeah, but see, the thing is that it's understandable. It's like they, they, they laid out a sort of a blueprint of where they want to go. Now they've got to get in there and get the details. It's like anything. You have a plan. I'm going to put a road here. And then you start looking at the you know, worries and stuff. You got, you're going to get different. So... I, I, I'm not going to not going to fault them for it. At least they should update it and be current, uh, because the people that are affected want to know they're affected, and that's more important. Uh, but from the point of view of the whole issue of the pipeline, we got to deal with a, some of these basic questions here. Right. Uh, anybody else? Why can't there be a town vote? We could be, but it won't, won't, it's not going to do anything. Not going to do anything, right? And I, we could. I mean, towns have done it, but we—it wasn't on our ballot, so we'd have to wait until next March to take a vote. Uh, we, the selectmen, have taken a position. Uh, we, as we get more data, we may be more st strong in our, our position. Um, there is, but the important thing I see is the—is it 17 communities? Which communities? Town, a special town voting. You've done it before for other things that 
If it may, would make a difference, I would agree with you. But let's concentrate on what we need to do and, and not on that, because that's not, not going to have much thing. It's more that we develop a regional. In other words, the 17 towns should be speaking with one voice. The National Regional Planning Commission area should be speaking one vo with one voice. When we get to that point, and we have the backing and the understanding of the issues, and we can resent that, then we're in a strong position. Anybody disagree with that? All right. All right. Any? Thank you for hanging around. Make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. Second. All right. All Any right. discussion? All right. Motion accepted. All Easy right. adjourn. Yeah, right.